Uh, let, before we get started, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Father, I come before you. I thank you, God, for your book. Thank you, God, for the privilege it is, God, to t open this book and teach it, God, to uh, whoever, anywhere, anytime. Thank you, God, for that freedom, that liberty. Thank you, God, for this great blessing that you've given us of the scriptures. And I pray that you'd speak through me this morning and uh, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, you'd minister to your people through this Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so go ahead and open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 46. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 46 and verse, uh, well, we'll get there in just a second. But this morning, I want to do a Bible study. This is actually probably going to be a two-part Bible study. But I want to do a Bible study on something that I believe the Lord gave to me recently in my Bible reading. And uh, like I said, I'm of the opinion, opinion that the Lord showed this to me, but obviously I'll let you be the judge of that. But it says here in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 3, Isaiah 46 verse 3, it says, Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. And even to your old age I am he, and even to whore hairs will I carry you. I have made, and I will bear, I, even I will carry, and will deliver you. All right, so now this was written by the prophet Isaiah, roughly around 712 BC, thereabouts, and it's a promise to the nation of Israel. It's a promise to literal flesh and blo uh, blood Jews in the context of the Old Testament here, and the Lord is promising them that He is committed to carrying them from birth to old age, and the sentiment here that the Lord is trying to convey is basically the same that we have in the New Testament I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. From birth to, to your old age, I will carry you. And uh, this is a consistent promise, honestly, that God makes uh, throughout the Bible to His people. No matter how old you get, God will not abandon you. The Bible says in Psalms 37, 25, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, forsaken by God, nor his seed begging bread. And when Jacob was uh, blessed Joseph on his deathbed, you remember he referred to God as the one uh, who fed me, quote, all my life long unto this day, and quote, redeemed me from all evil. All right, so God is faithful, and if you're a child of God, if you're born again, he will be with you from the beginning to the end of your life, from the, from the moment of your second birth to the end of your life, and then obviously in Christ you have eternal life, God is going to be faithful to you. And He's not going to cast you off in old age. And frankly, after you die, He's not going to leave you in darkness either. <laughs> Thank God. What a blessing that with Christianity, we know you don't just go into the ground and then you're just in darkness for the, re for the rest of eternity. God is faithful uh, unto death and even after death. Uh, God is faithful in life and He's faithful in death. And He's faithful in life after death, and we can thank God for that. And uh, God's promise of faithfulness uh, to you is true. And that's true even if you fail miserably. And that's true even if you get saved and live a life of walking in sin and darkness. God's promise to you does not change. He will be faithful even if you are not. The Bible says there in uh, 2 Timothy 2.13, If we believe not... Speaking to Christians, if we go so far down the road of sin and darkness and after, be, after being saved to the point where we just don't even believe in God anymore. The Bible addresses that. It says in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, He abideth faithful. So even if you're not faithful, thank God He is faithful. It says, He abideth faithful, He cannot deny Himself. Obviously, a Christian will suffer chastisement and repercussions for sin, but God will not break His everlasting covenant with you that He made with you the day you got saved. All right, And God's faithfulness to you is true. right? As Christians, we praise God. Amen. That's true. We believe in God's faithfulness. But listen, God's promise of faithfulness to the nation of Israel is just as true as His promise of faithfulness is to you. Okay? God keeps His promises. Look at Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. That doesn't mean there's not going to be hard times. That doesn't mean there's not going to be problems. The nation of Israel faced problems, but God's always been faithful to Israel. Israel's been off in, in apostasy, but God has still been faithful to Israel, and that's the same, the same thing is true for a Christian. Sometimes there's going to be problems. Sometimes there's going to be uh, tribulations and all kinds of bad things that can happen. That doesn't mean that God's not faithful. 
God is faithful through those things. All right. In Isaiah chapter 49, look at verse 14. He says here, But Zion, uh, that's a representative of the Jewish people essentially, he says, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. You know, so they're going through tough times, they're going through problems, they feel like everything's going bad. They say, oh, God hasn't kept His promise, God ha God's forsaken me. You know, and sometimes you feel that way. But he says here in verse 15, God reminds them, he says, Can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And maybe you're thinking, well, yeah, I guess in some exceptional circumstances that could happen. <laughs> and the Lord says, well, yeah, yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. It's not going to happen. God is not going to forget you. Thank, thank the Lord for that. Now, right now, the Jewish in, is in a state of blindness due to their rejection of God's words, that would be the Scriptures, and then also their rejection of God's Word, Jesus Christ. And from an allegorical or a typological standpoint, the nation of Israel is not dead right now. They're just blind. And someday, God will heal their blindness. And as Mark Peden aptly put it in a recent Bible study that he did, uh, he he said this, and it's very good, the Bible teaches restoration theology, not replacement theology. And uh, that truth is important in under understanding Bible prophecy, and that truth is going to be important in understanding what <coughs> the lesson I have for you today. But I want to begin this lesson by basically pointing out that, uh, God's comparison of the nation of Israel to a baby and then to an old man, there in Isaiah chapter 46. And the nation of Israel was called God's son back in the land of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 4.22, you remember Moses was sent to Pharaoh, and this was the message that Moses was supposed to tell Pharaoh. Uh, Exodus 4.22, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel, the nation of Israel, is my son, even my firstborn. That's Exodus 4.22. And God is stating here in Isaiah 46 that He has borne, essentially, the house of Jacob from the belly and has carried the nation of Israel from the womb. And so I started reading about this, and I was thinking, well, what is God referring to here? What exactly is that talking about? Obviously, God was not literally pregnant and gave birth to the nation of Israel. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. That, would, that, that idea would be essentially what we would call a literal interpretation of the Bible. He says, I've carried you from the belly. All right, well, a literal interpretation would be that God was pregnant with this nation of Israel and carrying around this nation, and uh, obviously that's ridiculous, and obviously that won't work. And that's why when it comes to interpretation of the Bible, we Bible believers put it this way. We say, always start, start with a literal interpretation first, and if the literal interpretation won't fit, or it's impossible, or it's insensible, then look at the allegorical interpretation, and that's fine. And um, God is obvi obviously, in this passage, we're dealing with an allegory. Obviously, in the passage, we're dealing with a metaphor. Um, we know that because God is a man. And men don't get pregnant. Shocker. <laughs> you know, spoiler alert for the modern millennial. Men don't get pregnant. So obviously that's not going to be a literal thing in the passage. And furthermore, nations don't emerge from birth canals. So obviously we know that that won't work. And uh, I stress that because there, there are a lot of allegories in the Bible. And it's not a compromise, and it's not apostasy to acknowledge that, okay? What you want to avoid is turning everything in the Bible into an allegory. And, um, you want, like I said, you want to start with a little, little literal interpretation, and if it won't work, then look into the allegorical interpretation. And if you do it that way, your Bible will make lots of sense, okay? And that way you can also keep the integrity of the Scriptures and believing the Word of God without trying to insert your opinion into every single passage, because no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. So the Bible has to come together and it has to fit, all right? So going along with this allegory, he says here that he likens the nation of Israel first to a baby, and then to an old man, there in Isaiah chapter 46. So, the question that I started wondering is, what would this carrying in the womb be? When did God carry the nation of Israel in the womb, per se? He, he's making these statements, okay, so they mean something, even if it is a metaphor. All right, so let's look at a few of these verses, and we'll see if we can figure out what God is referring to. When did God carry the nation of Israel in the womb? All right, Isaiah chapter 44, look at verse 1. 
It says, Yet now hear, O Jacob my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Then look at verse uh, 24. So that tells you the context of this chapter is the nation of Israel. Verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. All right, so he says, uh, we know that children are formed in the womb, and he likens the nation of Israel to a time of formation. All right, and that's likened to a time of a baby in the womb. The question is, when exactly did God form the nation of Israel? When did he form the nation as though it was a baby in the womb being formed and growing? And, and uh, you know, you think about maybe some ideas, okay, when would the origins of the nation of Israel be, where it would be likening to God forming a nation in the womb? Well, maybe you could say, well, it was when Jacob was having his twelve sons and by his two wives and his two concubines. That was the forming of the nation. Well, that's, that's a possibility. Maybe you could say, well, it was those 400 years, 430 years while the Jews were captive in the land of Egypt. That was likened to being formed in the womb. Maybe. Uh, you could also say maybe it was when the Jews were in the wilderness, or when the Jews were first uh, forming their kingdom in the land of Canaan under Joshua. And we can take some educated guesses, but uh, right now our choice would be somewhat subjective with the verses that we have right now. So let's look at a few more verses and see if we can figure out what this womb is exactly that God keeps referring to. Look at Isaiah chapter 49. The Lord mentions this multiple times. Isaiah chapter 49 the context here, again, is the nation of Israel. You can see that in verse 3. But in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, look at what it says here. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord hath called me, that's the nation of Israel, from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. All right, so that's interesting. He keeps referring to this forming, this this childbirth of the nation of Israel type of thing. Look at Isaiah chapter 48, verse 8. Isaiah 48, verse 8. We still haven't really found out where this womb is or what it is. But look at Isaiah chapter 48, verse 8. Yea, thou hearest not. Yea, thou knewest not. Yea, from the time that thine ear was not opened. <clears throat> For I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. Again, addressed to the nation of Israel. All right, so when was the nation of Israel a transgressor from the, from the womb? When and what is, is the earliest transgression of the nation of Israel that you can think of, as far as a nation is concerned? you have any thoughts, Judah? <laughs> Israel, do you have any thoughts? When was the earliest transgression of the nation of Israel? Really, if you were to think about the nation itself, as far as transgressions go, it would be Israel in the wilderness making those golden calves. The golden idols, remember, at Mount Sinai? Okay. Uh, they had complained, yes, they came out of Egypt, and they complained at the waters of Merah. They murmured about the bread, and then God sent the manna and the quails, and there were some different things. They fought Amalek and things like that. And, but then when they got down to Sinai, uh, all those things, yes, of murmuring and all that was sin. Okay. But the thing about creating an idol... After God had just split the waters of the Red Sea wide open and given them this miraculous deliverance and destroyed their enemies, God Almighty did that. And then God is, his, his glory and His presence is on the mountain of Sinai, causing the mountain to shake. And then they make these two idols and they say, Hey, here's your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. That was a transgression. There's a difference between sin, transgression, and iniquity. The waters of Merah, the murmuring, those things were sins, yes, but this thing right here was a transgression. This was crossing the line. And 3,000 people died because of it. All right? And the Lord says, you've been a transgressor from the womb. So that verse gives us a clue that the womb that God is referring to is Israel in the wilderness. The wilderness wandering was essentially the nation of Israel being in the womb and being formed at that time. Let me ask you a question. Maybe you know this one, Judah. How long was Israel in the wilderness for? You remember Israel? How long? Three days? Not quite. It was 40 years. 
Israel was wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Let me ask you this, how long is the average pregnancy for? Well, if you Google the question, how long is the average pregnancy, what will pop up on the top of your page is this, from uh, healthnewyork.gov. Pregnancy lasts for about 280 days or 40 weeks. 40 weeks. It says, it goes on to say, a preterm or premature baby is delivered before 37 weeks of your pregnancy. Extremely preterm infants are born 23 through 28 weeks. And moderately preterm infants are born between 29 and 33 weeks. All right? So a child is in the womb for 40 weeks. Israel is wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Interesting coincidence. But let's see if we have any more clues before we proceed just to nail this thing down. Turn to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. It's looking like Israel in the wilderness is what God is referring to when he says, I carried you from the womb. Isaiah 44, look at verse 1. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Verse 2. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. So here again, God is referring to this womb and forming the nation of Israel from the womb. And the, clear, and the clue here lies in that word Jeshurun, there in verse 2. And that's a, a very peculiar word to use in this verse, because this is the only time in the book of Isaiah that the word Jeshurun shows up. The word Jeshurun actually only shows up four times in the, in the whole entire Bible, once here in Isaiah, and the other three mentions are in the book of Deuteronomy. All right. So other than Deuteronomy, this is the only other time this word is used, and God carefully chose to use it in the context of Israel being formed in the womb. Okay, so let's take a look at the other context of the word Jeshurun, and that'll tell us exactly what the womb is that God is referring to. to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. All right, now I have to establish this by way of introduction, otherwise the whole rest of this lesson isn't going to make any sense. All right, but I'm proving to you by comparing Scripture with Scripture, this isn't just my opinion this isn't me just coming up with something off, out of the blue. I'm comparing Scripture with Scripture, trying to determine what does the Bible say this womb is that God keeps referring to. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is written by Moses at the end of the wilderness wandering. Look at verse 12. So the Lord alone did lead him, the nation of Israel, and there was no strange God with him. All right. Those, I, those golden calves were there for a moment, but you remember that they got smashed. They weren't allowed to continue with the nation of Israel. Okay? And then you skip down to verse 15. It says, but Jeshurun, all right, that's the first mention of the word, but there it is again. Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. What is Jeshurun? What is he even referring to? All right? Uh, Jeshurun is a word that means upright one. And it's a reference to the nation of Israel. It's another name for the nation of Israel. Israel waxed fat and kicked. You know, Jeshurun. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he, Israel, forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. Those are those golden calves. With abominations provoked they him to anger. All right, now that was Exodus 32, uh, while Moses was on Mount Sinai. So Jeshurun, uh, in the context, is a reference to the nation of Israel in the wilderness specifically. Okay, all right, look at uh, chapter 33, Deuteronomy 33, verse 4. Moses commanded us a law, even in the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob, and he, Moses, was a king in Jeshurun, when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. All right, when was Moses a, the leader, you know, he was a king. When was he a king of sorts among the nation of Israel? Well, it'd have to be while they were in the wilderness. Moses never went in, into the land of Canaan. So this, again, is a reference to the word Jeshurun, and it's Israel in the wilderness. All right, one more, Deuteronomy 33, verse 26. I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse by this point, but uh, it's important that you see what the Bible says, not just what I think. Deuteronomy 33, verse 26, There is none like unto the God of 
Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. All right, verse 27, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. All right, now that has some second advent uh, overtones, but as far as God riding in the sky, helping the nation of Israel, the only time you're going to be able to put that anywhere is going to be with the Exodus and the pillar and the wilderness wandering with the uh, pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, cloud and God up in the sky on Mount Sinai helping the nation of Israel. So again, every aspect, every reference of the word Jeshurun has to do with Israel being in the wilderness. So when God talks about Israel being born from the belly and carried from the womb, he's referring specifically to the days of Israel in the wilderness. And he likens those 40 years of wilderness wandering to the 40 years of a woman's pregnancy. I find that all really interesting. And the conception of the nation, if you will, I'm not 100% sure on it, but it's either going to be Passover when, uh, when uh, the, God gave the nation of Israel uh, the, the Passover, or Mount Sinai, or maybe both. They were both within a very short time of each other. Let me show you something real quick. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. There's something interesting about this. So we know that Israel is likened to a baby in the womb in the wilderness. So I want to show you something about the conception of the nation of Israel and some interesting things about it. All right, Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Here are a few things to think about if it's the Passover being the conception of the nation. All right, Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year unto you. All right, so the 14th day of the first month is the Passover, and uh, it could possibly be regarded as the night of Israel's conception as a nation. And you might say that since Israel is the Son of God, uh, this is the night that the man-child was born. And that's interesting. Turn to Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3. Israel, the nation, being likened unto a son, it would be a man-child being born. Okay. Look what Job has to say about this man-child being conceived. Job chapter 3. Job, you'll remember, is a type of the nation of Israel. And in Job chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish. Okay, now this is Job speaking of himself. But from a typological standpoint, think about this in context of the nation of Israel. Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, there is a man-child conceived. Now think about that verse for a second. Birth and conception are two completely separate things. How would anyone have known exactly when Job was conceived in order to make that statement? How is anybody going to make an announcement like that? <laughs> Who's the one making the statement here in Job 3, uh, 3 verse uh, 3? Who's the one saying there's a man-child conceived? It can only be God. I find that very interesting. God gives conception because conception and birth are elements of creation by the Creator. And whenever a child is conceived, God says there's an announcement in heaven. There's a man-child conceived. Or there's a maid-child conceived. There's someone in heaven is making that statement. I find that interesting. And in our modern society, Planned Parenthood follows God's statement with, there's a man-child aborted. But that's another subject. Then it says there in verse 4, uh, Job says this about the night of his conception. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud Dwell upon it, let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it, let it not be joined unto the days of the years, let it not come into the number of the months. All of that verbiage is especially interesting when you compare it to the night of Israel's departure from Egypt. Remember, in the night when Israel ex <coughs> exited out of the land of Egypt, and the angel of death... The destroyer was going through and killing the firstborn among the Egyptians. So Israel was the man-child and was conceived, evidently, the night of the Passover in Egypt. And interestingly enough, let me just point this out. If that was the conception, if you will, of the nation of Israel and God is their father, 
then what exactly would the mother be? <laughs> it makes you think that would make Egypt a mother of sorts. And interestingly enough, Egypt is called Rahab in Psalms 87, 89, and Isaiah 51. And the other Rahab in the Bible was a harlot associated with a certain color, a scarlet cord. And I also read in the Bible that another name for idols is abominations. And Israel's original idolatry on Mount Sinai was due to the mixed multitude of the Egyptians among them and the Egyptian influence. And so I find it interesting that Egypt in the Bible is associated with harlots and abominations and may even be a mother of sorts. <laughs> interesting. I'll let you think about that for a while. It's possible that Sinai could have been the conception of Israel with the covenant there, and you get some of that stuff from Romans 7 and Galatians 3. Uh, so I'll let you figure that out on your own as to when the exact beginning of the nation of Israel was there. But for now, I'm going to go with uh, Passover being the conception, the 40 years in the wilderness being the gestation of the nation, and the crossing of Jordan was the birth, essentially, of the nation of Israel. So if Israel's 40 years in the wilderness... <coughs> is likened to 40 weeks, or approximately the nine months of a baby in the womb, then what we have here, interestingly enough, is another uh, prophetic Bible calculator, or a uh, more appropri appropriately, maybe, another Bible abacus, you might say. Now, there's a few Bible calculators in the Bible. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. All right? So we know that uh, one of the Bible calculators that you can use in the Bible is a thousand years is equal to one day, and vice versa, from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. So when we're, the Lord gives you dates, uh, you know, you can use some of these Bible calculators and find some interesting prophetic uh, types. All right, another Bible calculator is in Daniel 9.27, where it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city and all that stuff. And what you end up having there is um, one literal year is the equivalent of one prophetic day. All right, so Daniel's 70th week... Okay, we always talk about that's a, a week of seven days. That's the equivalent of seven years. Three and a half years was fulfilled in the time of Jesus Christ. And the other three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week will be fulfilled uh, in the time of the Antichrist, the final three and a half years of the tribulation. But as you can see there, there's another b prophetic Bible calculator where it doesn't say Daniel's uh, seven years. It says Daniel's 70th week. Okay, so a day is equal to a year in that thing, and that's a whole other study. But uh, you're probably familiar with that already. So here we have another Bible calculator. Calculator. We have 40 years is equal to 40 weeks. Okay, so that'd be one year for one week. Okay, 40 years in the wilderness is the equivalent of 40 weeks, like a child. All right. So what that would mean is you could say, well, 50 years is equal to 50 weeks, right? Or one year is equal to one week, okay? Now, technically, that's pretty close to one year, okay? Uh, 50 weeks, it, 50, there's 52 weeks in a year, or they say exactly 51.43 weeks to a year. So since 50 weeks to one year is you know close enough, I'm just going to round to that. Here's what I'm getting at. Here's what I'm getting at for this lesson, all right? Uh, 50 literal historical years is equal to one allegorical year as far as the lifespan of the nation of Israel is concerned. All right? If 40 years is likened to nine allegorical months, the time in the womb, then God's biblical abacus here would essentially be 50 years is equal, 50 years would be equal to one year, as far as Israel is concerned, all right? So 50 literal years can equal 12 allegorical months or one allegorical year, all right? I hope that makes sense. But this is what I'm going to go with, because when we start looking at these dates, this is going to correspond to the age of the nation of Israel. And as God said, I've carried you from the womb all the way to your old age. And we're going to see how old the nation of Israel is 
uh, in its old age. And uh, we won't get to all of it today, but let's look at this next part here. Um, you're going to find these parallels, I think, pretty astonishing. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. With that Bible calculation in place, we're able to look at a number of significant events in Israel's history and measure or uh, ascertain Israel's age, if you will, at the time of the event. All right, Ezekiel chapter 16, look at verse 1. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 1. It says, uh, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day that thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not, not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon Upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. All right, so bear in mind that these verses right here are referring to the city of Jerusalem, not the nation of Israel per se. God is addressing the city of Jerusalem. When God said, Thy mother was an Amorite and thy father an Hittite, he's not referring to anything that has to do with Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Okay, their mothers and fathers were not Amorites and Hittites. Okay, he's referring to the city of Jerusalem. He's speaking to a city that was founded by the Amorite and the Hittite people. Not the Palestinians, by the way. It was founded by the Amorite and the Hittite people, and that city was basically a garbage dump of a city and was cast out by those people. Nobody liked Jerusalem back at that time. It was essentially the uh, Gresham of the land of Canaan, if you will. <laughs> uh, or nowadays you might say it was the Portland of the land of Canaan. Portland's been so destroyed by BLM and Antifa. All right, uh, Verse 6, And when I passed by thee, this is God speaking, When I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, Jerusalem, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. <coughs> So God's passing by the land, the city of Jerusalem is probably a reference to Joshua and the angel of the Lord going through the land of Canaan and wiping out the inhabitants of that land. All right, when else would God have passed by Jerusalem specifically? You do read about uh, Joshua fighting the kings of Jerusalem when they went into the land of Canaan. So the city of J uh, Jerusalem wasn't conquered at the time of Joshua. Uh, it wouldn't be conquered until David came along, actually 450 years later. But God did pass by, if you will, and saw Jerusalem at that time. And apparently, if I'm understanding this correct, God told that dying city as the angel of the Lord and Joshua are fighting the armies and they pass by Jerusalem to go and attack all these other cities. There's a lot of cities to conquer in the days of Joshua. Jerusalem wasn't one that they attacked. It was up on a high hill. But as God was passing by the angel of the Lord, he said unto that city, live. And from that time on, Jerusalem was the city that God chose that he was going to put his throne upon. Even though that didn't happen until David came along for 450 years, but at the time of Joshua, God said, that's the city that I'm going to put my throne upon. So Israel was born, if you will, when they crossed Jordan in 1450 BC. This would essentially be the birth of Israel right there. Okay? And right here during the wilderness wandering of uh, 40 years would be the gestation period while Israel was in the womb. And they were born when they entered into the land of Canaan. 40 weeks, 40 years. What happens after 40 weeks when a woman is pregnant? The baby's born. What happened after 40 years of Israel wandering in the wilderness? They crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan. All right. So Israel was born in 1450 B.C., roughly. That's the date, the standard date that's given. Jerusalem is likened to an abandoned newborn baby when Joshua was going through it in 1450 B.C. So that would uh, make the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem the same age, if you will, from an allegorical standpoint. Okay? Israel was just being born. 
Jerusalem was a city that was likened to a little newborn baby cast out in its blood. All right, verse 7. So they're the same age at that time. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. All right, so the city of Jerusalem and the people of Israel are starting to intersect here. Uh, Jerusalem prospered and became a glorious city when it was conquered by the Jewish people, and David uh, made it his royal city. So God says, I, I'm beautifying this city. And that's when the Jews took it over. All right, verse uh, 8. He says, Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. All right, now this is a second passing by that God is doing. God is passing by again. Okay, and this time he's not seeing a destitute baby, but rather a young girl, if you will. And he says, And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord, and thou becamest mine. All right, now this isn't, this is a cultural thing. This isn't any kind of perverted thing. All right, he said, I entered into a covenant with thee. That's what that spreading of the skirt is. The, this historical event that God is referring to uh, best matches the description that best matches this description is really the building of the temple in Jerusalem and God entering into a covenant with Solomon and Israel concerning that temple when God when Solomon built the temple God made a special covenant with Solomon at that, at that time in first Kings 6 11 I'll read it for you and the word of the Lord came unto Solomon saying concerning this house which thou art building if thou wilt walk in my statutes, and execute my judgments, and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I, one, perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father, and I will, number two, dwell among the children of Israel, and will not forsake my people Israel. All right, now this covenant that God made with Solomon when the temple was built was essentially an addendum to the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, God had already obviously made a, a promise to Abraham in regards to multiplying his offspring and giving him the land of Canaan. But uh, then, at Sinai, God made an additional provision to his covenant. That he, would go, that he would go even further and say, I will bless the people of Israel if they keep the law, or the Ten Commandments. And then when the temple was built, God made another additional provision that he would go ahead and dwell right there in Jerusalem if they would keep the law and the Ten Commandments. So there, these are not completely separate covenants, but these are essentially addendums, or God is uh, sweetening the deal for the Jews, and Solomon's covenant addendum was likened to God spreading his skirt over the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. So the spreading of the skirt, like I said, it seems really odd to us. You know, obviously men don't even wear skirts these days, but back in those days, you know, they had those garments, the robes and stuff, and they would spread the skirt over the woman. And it seems really strange, but that ancient cultural practice uh, was the equivalent of our modern engagement ring. That's essentially what it was. It represented a promise from the man to the woman that he has chosen her to be his wife and that he will follow through with his promise to marry her and take her into his own household. All right, so, and you see that in the book of Ruth. That same thing happens. All right, the spreading of the skirt or the engagement is along the lines of a betrothal. You know, a woman is selected for marriage. Now, bear in mind here, this is an engagement. This is not the marriage itself, this is an engagement. And sometimes the time gap, the abacus, we get, we get this. Four, let's see, I'll put it over here. So we got 1450 minus 1005 equals 445 years. All right? If we divide 445 years by 50, okay? which is what we have here, 50 literal years equals one allegorical year, what we come out with is 8.9 allegorical years. Allegorical years old. So essentially, at this time, when God became engaged, if you will, to the nation of Israel, Jerusalem slash the nation of Israel was essentially a nine-year-old girl based on this Bible abacus. Now, you know, granted, that's a bit too young, but bear in mind a couple of things. Number one, we're dealing with an allegory, and it's not literal. <laughs> okay. Number two, 
Um, it wasn't unheard of in ancient times for women to be married as soon as they became of childbearing age, which could be as young as 13 years old. Number three, when it comes to princesses and royalty, they can have pre-arranged marriages long before they are of marrying age. And number four, this engagement is just that. It's just a promise from God that he is going to marry Jerusalem someday. There is no actual marriage taking place between God and this nine-year-old girl, if you will. So uh, God is not like Mohammed, okay? Uh, Mohammed married Aisha, and they were completely husband and wife when she was only nine year old, nine, a nine-year-old girl. Uh, God is not a sick pervert like Mohammed was. Uh, this promise from God was an engagement from him to Jerusalem. Uh, he had said, he's saying, I'm selecting you, and I am going to marry you someday. And the actual marriage was to come later when Jerusalem was a little bit older. But I'll come back to that. All right, look at verse 9. He says, Then washed I thee with water, then I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. All right, now bear in mind that Jerusalem was a Jebusite stronghold until David took it in approximately 1048 BC. And between that time and the building of the temple was only, you know, 50 years. From when David took it to when Solomon built the temple, it was only 50 years. So, from an allegorical time standpoint, Jerusalem washing, Jeru God washing Jerusalem from their blood with all the Hittites and the Jebusites there, to him anointing it with oil, the building of the, of the, te the temple, uh, is really uh, practically simultaneous events from this uh, allegorical standpoint. Okay, So, verse 10. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skins, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put brace, bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen, and silk, and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour, and honey, and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom." Again, he's describing the beautification of Jerusalem, and this became the capital of the kingdom. And verse 14, And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. He's talking about all the blessings that he gave to Jerusalem, and the glory of Jerusalem, and the glory of the city, and the palace, and the temple. But over time, things started to go wrong, and Israel began to go into apostasy. And first, the northern... Uh, uh, northern Israel degenerated into full-fledged idolatry under King Jeroboam. And bear in mind, in the Bible, idolatry is spiritual cheating, you know, spiritual adultery. And uh, they had taken other gods instead of, the, uh, instead of the Lord God, all right? And then what ended up happening is after the, the northern kingdom of Israel went apostate, the southern kingdom of Israel started to follow their idolatrous path, but it went back and forth, you know, for the southern kingdom for quite a few years. You know, they had idolatry, then they got right with God, then they had some idols, got right with God. Uh, King Solomon essentially opened the the door of idolatry for the Jews in that southern kingdom. And then later on, King Jehoram furthered the idolatry. And then a couple of years later, Ahaz made the idolatry worse. You know, there are some good kings and bad kings in between there. And then finally, toward the end of uh, southern ki Israel's history, King Manasseh crossed the line. And he crossed the line by putting an idol in the temple. That's a big deal. Second uh, Chronicles 33, verse 7 says, And he, Manasseh, set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God. None of the other kings were brazen enough to do that. They had their idol idols across the city and in the high places and the groves, but nobody put it in the temple. That was Manasseh's doing. And uh, he says, He put it in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, Okay, uh oh, here comes that remembrance of the engagement covenant, right? He said, God had said, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed to your fathers. Here's the condition. So that, or basically so long as they, as so, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them. That was the condition. You do what I command you. And I'll bless you, all right? According to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinance by the hand of Moses. All right, so after Manasseh did this, Jerusalem's fate was sealed. 
He stuck an idol in the temple, and that was it. The next king was Josiah. And even though Josiah was a good king who did a lot of good things, it was too late. It was too late for Jerusalem. That was it. He crossed the line. Manasseh crossed the line. Jeremiah began his preaching after Manasseh in the reign of Josiah. And God told him, even during the good reign of Josiah, three different times, do not pray for this people. Why? Because it was done. God had had, it, had, had enough. Manasseh had already crossed the line before Jeremiah was probably even born. And God says to Jeremiah, preach to these people, but don't, you're not gonna, don't pray to me to have mercy on, on this city. It's already, it's already crossed the line. I'll be gracious to Josiah for the good things that he did, but uh, beyond that, it was done. And uh, sure enough, in came the Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar, and they destroyed Jerusalem and burned down the temple in Jeremiah's lifetime. And God did this because Jeremiah, or God did this because Jerusalem was engaged to him, but during the prolonged engagement, okay, as Jerusalem got older, they're waiting for the marriage, the coming of the son, but they were engaged at this time, and during this prolonged engagement, uh, Jerusalem, the Jews, started, the, spiritually speaking, started to become promiscuous. Jeremiah 3.20 says, Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherous with, treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. And uh, so they were supposed to be faithful to God during that engagement, but she wasn't. And interestingly enough, in the Old Testament law, there are two specific sins that a person was, uh, that someone was to be burned in the fire for. You remember that the normal means of execution uh, for capital punishment was stoning in the Old Testament, but there are two times where God specifically said, I want you to burn somebody, evidently burn them alive. That's pretty rough. Okay, number one, was a man in Leviticus 2014, the first, the first instance, is for this sin. A man who marries a woman and her mother. And uh, you say, well, what's the significance of that? Well, that's really interesting, and there's an important reason to that, why that person in specifically would be burned. Because it has to do with uh, Mystery Babylon. And you remember that Nimrod is also regarded as Tammuz, the beginning of that whole mystery Babylonian religion, Semiramis claimed to have been married to her son and her husband. So, so Nimrod would, in, would in, in, in essence be married to his wife and his mother. There's an interesting Babylonian connection there. And Babylon, mystery Babylon, is going to be burned down. You remember that in Revelation chapter 17. So there's an interesting prophetic reason that God said, don't stone those people, I want you to burn them. All right, and the second one is uh, a priest's daughter, if uh, she commits lewd activity. Uh, Leviticus 21 verse 9 says, And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father, she shall be burnt with fire. Not stoned, burnt. And that's really interesting. That's some oddly specific criteria. <laughs> but that's exactly what Jerusalem did. Jerusalem, throughout the Bible, another, another phrase that represents Jerusalem is called the daughter of Jerusalem. It's not Jerusalem's daughter, it's Jerusalem is a daughter. The daughter of Jerusalem is Jerusalem, and, and she's referred to a daughter throughout the Bible. Her relation to God puts her in that priest category, okay? And Jerusalem played the harlot, and for, for that she was burned by the Babylonians. Ezekiel 16, verse 15, look at this. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty, and playest the harlot because of thy renown, and pourest out thy fornications on every one that passed by, his it was. All right, this is another allegory referring to idolatry, specifically. Jerusalem basically started taking every god and any god that came into town. Any visiting nation, oh, you've got a god? Let's add this to our pantheon of gods, and we'll worship that god too. And in verse 30, we'll skip down. You can read this passage. It's pretty rough. But in verse 30, it says this, How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman. Look at verse 35. Wherefore, O harlot, <laughs> he's referring to his espoused wife, <laughs> this woman that he's betrothed to, this espoused girlfriend of his. He's saying, you're a harlot. Because she is. She's, she's going with other gods. 
He was engaged to her. I'm going to marry you. And she's getting into all this, all this garbage. He says, Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Look at verse 38. And I will, look at this, And I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood in fury and in jealousy. All right? Verse 39. And I will also give thee into their hand the Babylonians, and they shall throw down thine eminent place, that would be the temple, and shall break down thy high places. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes, and shall take thy fair jewels, and leave thee naked and bare. All right, this is allegorical of a city having its wealth and its riches taken and the gold stripped off its buildings. All right, verse 40. He says, And they shall also bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones, and thrust thee through with their swords, and they shall burn thine houses with fire, and execute judgments upon thee in the sight of many women, that would be the surrounding cities, and I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot, and thou shalt uh, give no, no hire any more. So will I make my fury toward thee to rest, and my jealousy shall depart from me, and I will be quiet, and I will be no more angry. Because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but hast fretted me in all these things, behold, therefore I also will recompense thy way upon thine head, saith the Lord God, and thou shalt not commit this lewdness above all thine abominations. All right, so the, to wrap things up, the Babylon destruction and the 70 years of captivity that was uh, put upon Israel. All right, so you have these three different attacks of Babylon, that Babylonian destruction and the 70 years of captivity essentially fixed the Jews' idolatry problem. They were very idolatrous prior to that point, but after the Babylonian captivity, there's no more idolatry in Jerusalem. You don't find or read about Israel going back into that idolatry after that. All right? Uh, as a nation, they haven't worshipped idols since. Now, their problem right now, the Jews' problem right now, is covetousness which is another form of idolatry, which is interesting. But uh, nevertheless, when Ezekiel wrote this condemnation of Jerusalem, Ezekiel himself, the prophet, was already a captive in Babylon when he wrote this. Uh, the Babylonian attacks came in three waves, and Ezekiel was taken captive in the second wave. Daniel was taken captive in the first wave in 606 B.C. Ezekiel was taken captive in the second wave in 594 B.C. And so Ezekiel is writing between 594 and 586 when he's writing this. And Jerusalem hasn't been destroyed at that point. But Ezekiel is saying, you are, Jerusalem is going to be burned down. It's going to be destroyed. And uh, the temple and the city got destroyed in that third wave. All right. So the time of Ezekiel's writing is approximately 594 B.C. The time of King Manasseh's sin was approximately 710 B.C. All right, So it was quite a ways before Ezekiel wrote about it. So uh, let's wrap up here, but let me show you one more thing here. Let's see how old Jerusalem, the engaged girl, was when these things happened. As we've seen at the time of Solomon, allegorically, Jerusalem, at the time of that covenant, at the time of the temple, at the time of God selecting Jerusalem as the city that He's going to marry someday, uh, she, uh, Jerusalem was essentially nine years old from this allegorical standpoint here. All right, Manasseh. Let's look at Manasseh. Where's my blue marker? All right, Manasseh. So we're going to go with 1450, the birth of Israel, to Manasseh, which is 710 B.C. And what you have there is a 740-year time period. Okay? Now you divide 740 years by 50, because 50 literal years is the equivalent of one allegorical year as far as the, the age of the nation of Israel. 740 divided by 50, and you get 14.8 years old. So when Jerusalem crossed the line and got into really bad idolatry, uh, Jerusalem was essentially a 15-year-old girl who was spending all the wrong time in all the wrong places with all the wrong people. And that's when she got into big trouble. When she was essentially 15 years old, God says, that's it. You're done. I'm going to say nine years old here. Okay. Uh, Ezekiel's prophecy. Once again, 1450 minus uh, 594 B.C. is 856 years. And you divide 856 by 50. And what you have at the time of Ezekiel and also, you know, within 10 years, the time of the Babylonian captivity. So I'm just going to put these two together, Ezekiel and Babylon. 856 divided by 50, you get uh, 
17.12 years old. And if you go with 586 in that equation, you end up coming out with Israel being 17.28 years old. So what you have there is Jerusalem is burned with fire, and the judgment comes upon that city when Jerusalem is essentially a 17-year-old woman, a teenager. Jerusalem was burned with fire before she reached her 18th birthday. All right, so let's go ahead and stop there for today, but the story doesn't end there. All right, that wasn't the, the end of Jerusalem, nor was that the end of God's covenant with that city. God is still going to take Jerusalem back, and God is still going to make the, uh, fix things with that girl, and He is going to marry that woman someday, and there's a reason why Jesus Christ was called the bridegroom before there was any church, because He was looking for a bride, and the bride was supposed to be the one that He was engaged to back when the temple was built. And so you have the friend of the bridegroom being John the Baptist and the bridegroom being Jesus Christ, but then there was a problem. And we'll get into more of that next week. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I come before you today. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the marvelous things in this book and just how this book is so seamless in so many ways, God. And Father, I pray that this was a blessing to your people and gave them some understanding and some uh, understanding of the history of Israel and understanding of some of these texts that might have been... Uh, somewhat difficult to understand. There's some things in the Bible that are, you know, uh, sometimes complicated, Father, if you're just reading them for the first time. But I pray that this would give your people understanding and was a blessing to them and would strengthen them throughout the week and just help them to marvel at your book. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.